So this is an essay, um, a comparison and contrast essay by Fatima Mernisi. Uh, and she's a writer, a teacher, and a feminist sociologist. Um, she was born in 1940, um, and she's um, in, she was born in Morocco, but she studied um, in Paris and Massachusetts, um, so in the States. Uh, she writes in French, English, and Arabic. Um, wait, let's see, I'm going to try and... Here's the pointer. Okay, yeah, so she writes in French, English, and Arabic, um, and here's some of the, the things she's written. Um, she writes a lot about Muslim society in the modern world. Um, and now she's a professor and a research scholar um, at the University of Muhammad in um, Morocco. And yeah, so she's really accomplished and has written a lot of interesting and important things. So this is called Size 6, the Western Woman's Harem. Um, and she was actually raised in a harem, which is a traditional Muslim um, enclave of women and children um, in, in a Muslim household. And it's off limits to men. So she was only with women and children. Um, and when she traveled outside of the Middle East, um, she encountered common Western misconceptions of a harem as either a peaceful pleasure or an orgiastic feast uh, in which men reign supreme over obedient women, when in fact Muslim men and women both acknowledge the inequality of the harem, and women resist men in any way they can. Um, so this is from um, this book that she called or this book that she wrote in 2001, um, and she explores the mystery of the Western harem. So what, so the Western, you know, world, which would be, you know, Europe, Western Europe and um, America and Canada, um, you know, the Western um, uh, culture. And so she um, tries to understand, and in Mexico and South America probably too, it would definitely um, fall into that. But anyway, um, so she tries to understand why outsiders imagine harem women as totally compliant and unthreatening to men. In the last chapter of the book, um, she finds her answer. So, um, so they say that she does cite her sources here, um, but it's different. It's not MLA citations. Um, it's the Chicago Manual of Style, which is slightly different. But, um, but she does give credit to where these, um, you know, sources come from or cite, you know, where this information that is not her own um, comes from. So that's the important thing about citations. Okay. It was during my unsuccessful attempt to buy a cotton skirt in an American department store that I was told my hips were too large to fit into a size six. That distressing experience made me realize how the image of beauty in the West can hurt and humiliate a woman as much as the veil does when enforced by the state police in extremist nations such as Iran, Afghanistan, Saudi Arabia. Yes, that day I stumbled onto one of the keys of the enigma of passive beauty in Western harem fa fantasies. The elegant sales lady in the American beauty store looked at me without moving from her desk and she said that she had no skirt in my size. In this whole big store there's no skirt for me, I said. You are joking. I felt very suspicious and thought she just might be too tired to help me. I could understand that. But the saleswoman added a condescending judgment, which sounded to me like an imam's fatwa. So an imam is a Muslim religious leader. Um, it left no room for discussion. You are too big, she said. I'm too big compared to what? I asked, looking at her intently, because I realized that I was facing a critical cultural gap here. Compared to a size six, came the sales lady's reply. Her voice had a clear cut edge to it that is typical of those who enforce religious laws. Size four and six are the norm, she went on, discouraged by my bewildered look. Encouraged by my bewildered look, sorry. Deviant sizes, such as the one you need, can be bought in special stores. This was the first time I had ever heard such nonsense about my size. In the Moroccan streets, men's flattering comments regarding my particularly generous hips have for decades led me to believe that the entire planet shared their convictions. 
It is true that with the age, I have been hearing fewer and fewer flattering comments when walking in the Medina, and sometimes the silence around me in the bazaars is deafening. But since my face has never met with the local beauty standards, and I have often had to defend myself against remarks such as Zirafa or giraffe, uh, because of my long neck, I learned long ago not to rely too much on the outside world for my sense of self-worth. In fact, paradoxically, as I discovered when I went to Rabat as a student, it was the self-reliance that I had developed to protect myself against beauty blackmail that made me attractive to others. My male fellow students could not believe that I did not give a damn about what they thought about my body. You know, my dear, I would say in response to one of them, all I need to survive is bread, olives, and sardines. That you think my neck is long is, not, is your problem, not mine. In any case, when it comes to beauty and compliments, not too serious or definite in the Medina, where everything can be negotiated. But things seem to be different in that American department store. In fact, I have to confess that I lost my usual self-confidence in that New York environment. Not that I am always sure of myself, but I don't walk around the Moroccan streets or down the university corridors wondering what people are thinking about me. Of course, when I hear a compliment, my ego expands like a cheese souffle, but on the whole, I don't expect to hear much from others. Some mornings I feel ugly because I am sick or tired. Others I feel wonderful because it's sunny out and I have written a good paragraph. But suddenly in that peaceful American store that I had entered so triumphantly, as a sovereign consumer ready to spend money, I felt savagely attacked. My hips, until then the sign of a relaxed and uninhibited maturity, were suddenly being condemned as a deformity. And who says that everyone must be a size six? I joked to the sales lady that day, deliberately neglecting to mention size four, which is the size of my skinny 12 year old niece. At that point, the sales lady gave me an anxious. The norm is everywhere, my dear, she said. It's all over. In the magazines, on television, in the ads, you can't escape it. There's Calvin Klein, Ralph Lauren, Johnny Versace, Giorgio Armani, Mario Valentino, Salvatore Ferragamo, Christian Dior, Yves Saint Laurent, Christian Lacroix, and Jean Paul Gaultier. Big department stores go by the norm, she paused and then concluded. If they sold size 14 or 16, which is probably what you need, they would go bankrupt. She stopped for a minute and then stared at me, intrigued. Where on earth do you come from? I'm sorry I can't help you. Really, I am. And she looked it, too. She seemed all of a sudden interested and brushed off another woman who was seeking her attention with the cutting. Get someone else to help you. I'm busy. Only then did I notice that she was probably my age, in her late 50s. But unlike me, she had the thin body of an adolescent girl. Her knee-length navy blue Chanel dress had a white silk collar reminiscent of the subdued elegance of aristocratic French Catholic schoolgirls at the turn of the century. A pearl-studded belt emphasized the slimness of her waist. With her meticulously styled short hair and sophisticated makeup, she looked half my age at first glance. I come from a country where there is no size for women's clothes, I told her. I buy my own material, and the neighborhood seamstress or craftsman makes me the silk or leather skirt I want. They just take my measurements each time I see them. Neither the seamstress nor I know exactly what my si what size my new skirt is. We discover it together in the making. No one cares about my size in Morocco as long as I pay my taxes on time. Actually, I don't know what my size is, to tell you the truth. The saleswoman laughed merrily and said that I should advertise my country as a paradise for stressed working women. You mean you don't watch your weight? She inquired with a tinge of disbelief in her voice. And then, after a brief moment of silence, she added in a lower register, as if talking to herself. Many women working in highly paid fashion-related jobs could lose their positions if they didn't keep to a strict diet. Her words sounded so simple, but the threat they implied was so cruel that I realized for the first time that maybe size six is a more violent restriction imposed on women than is the Muslim veil. Quickly, I said goodbye so as to not make any more demands on the sales, lady time, sales lady's time or involve her in any more unwelcome confidential exchanges about age discriminating salary cuts. A surveillance camera was probably watching both of us. Yes, I thought as I wandered off, I have finally found the answer to my harem enigma. Unlike the Muslim man who uses space to establish male domination, by excluding women from the public arena, the Western man manipulates time and light. 
he declares that in order to be beautiful, a woman must look 14 years old. If she dares to look 50, or worse, 60, she is beyond the pale. By cutting the spotlight on a female child and framing her as the ideal of beauty, he condemns the mature woman to invisibility. In fact, the modern Western man enforces Immanuel Kant's 19th century theories. To be beautiful, women have to appear childish and brainless. When a, mature, when a woman looks mature and self-assertive, she allows her hips to expand. Um, she is condemned as ugly. Thus, the walls of the European harem separate youthful beauty from ugly maturity. These Western attitudes, I thought, are even more dangerous and cunning than the Muslim ones because the weapon used against women is time. Time is less visible, more fluid than space. The Western man uses images and spotlights to freeze female beauty within an idealized childhood and forces women to perceive aging, that normal unfolding of years, as a shameful devaluation. Here I am transformed into a dinosaur, I caught myself saying aloud as I went up and down the rows of skirts in the store, hoping to prove the saleslady wrong, to no avail. This Western time-defined veil is even crazier than the space-defined one enforced by the Ayatollahs. And uh, Ayatollahs are um, authorities who interpret religious law. The violence embodied in the Western harem is less visible than in the Eastern harem because aging is not attacked directly, but rather masked as an aesthetic choice. Yes, I suddenly felt not only very ugly, but also quite useless in that store, where if you had big hips, you were simply out of the picture. You drifted into the fringes of nothingness. By putting the spotlight on the prepubescent female, the Western man veils the older, more mature woman, putting her in shrouds of ugliness. This idea gives me chills because it tattoos the invisible harem directly onto a woman's skin. Chinese foot binding worked in the same way. Men declared women Men declared beautiful only those women who had small, childlike feet. Chinese men did not force women to bandage their feet to keep them from developing normally. All they did was to define the beauty ideal. In feudal China, a beautiful woman was the one who voluntarily sacrificed her right to unhindered physical movement by mutilating her own feet and thereby proving that her main goal in life was to please men. Similarly, in the Western world, I was expected to shrink my hips into a size six if I wanted to find a decent skirt tailored for a beautiful woman. We Muslim women who have only one month of fasting, Ramadan. We Muslim women have only one month of fasting, Ramadan. But the poor Western woman who diets has to fast 12 months out of the year. Kal horror. Horror. Um, that means what a horror. Um, I keep repeating to myself while looking around at the American women shopping. All those my age look like youthful teenagers. Now at last, the mystery of my Western harem made sense. Framing youth as beauty and condemning maturity is a weapon used against women in the West, just as limiting access to public space is a weapon used in the East. The objective remains identical in both cultures, to make women feel unwelcome, inadequate, and ugly. The power of the Western man resides in dictating what women should wear and how they should look. He controls the whole fashion industry, from cosmetics to underwear. The West, I realized, was the only part of the world where women's fashion is a man's business. In places like Morocco, where you design your own clothes and discuss them with craftsmen and women, fashion is your own business, not so in the West. But how does the system function, I wondered. Why do women accept it? One of the possible uh, of all of the possible explanations i like that of the french sociologist pierre bordeaux the best in his latest book la domination masculine he proposes something he calls la violence symbolique symbolic violence is a form of power which is hammered directly on the body and as if by magic without any apparent physical constraint but this magic operates only because it is it activates the codes pounded in the deepest layers of the body. Reading Bordeaux, I had the impression that I finally understood Western man's psyche better. The cosmetic and fashion industries are only the tip of the iceberg, he states, which is why women are so ready to adhere to their dictates. Something else is going on on a far deeper level. Otherwise, why would women belittle themselves spontaneously? 
Why, argues Bordeaux, would women make their lives more difficult, for example, by preferring men who are taller or older than they are? The majority of French women wish to have a husband who is older, and also, uh, which seems consistent, bigger as far as size is concerned, writes Bordeaux. Caught in the enchanted submission characteristic of the symbolic violence inscribed in the mysterious layers of the flesh, women relish what he calls les signes ordinaires de la hierarchie sexuelle, the ordinary signs of sexual hierarchy, such as old age and a larger body. By doing so, explains Bordeaux, women spontaneously accept the subservient position. Is this spontaneity Bordeaux describes as it is this spontaneity Bordeaux describes as magic enchantment. Once I understood how this magic submission worked, I became very happy that the conservative Ayatollahs do not know about it yet. If they did, they would readily switch to its more sophisticated methods because they are so much more effective. To deprive me of food is definitely the best way to paralyze my thinking capabilities. I thank you, Allah, for sparing me the tyranny of the size six harem, I did to myself while seated on the Paris Casablanca flight on my way back home at last. I am so happy that the conservative male elite does not know about it. Imagine the fundamentalists switching from the veil to forcing women to fit size six. How can you stage a credible political demonstration and shout in the streets that your human rights have been violated when you cannot find the right skirt?